Start. Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. Today, we've got a game that I've been sitting on for a few years now. Haiku the Robot. For those of you who don't know, Haiku is a Metroidvania that came out in 2022. It has some really tight controls, beautiful artwork, and even won several awards, like Best Solo Dev Game of 2022. Back when it first came out, I actually talked a bit with the dev, and he kindly gave me a game key so I could play it and potentially make a challenge run for it. And then life got in the way and I got distracted and I'm pretty sure I stopped sleeping for a few weeks around that time so that didn't. But now, two years later, I'm finally going back to keep my word and make some content about the game. I uh, yeah, sorry about the wait. So what exactly are we doing today? Well, Haiku, as you might have guessed, is a robot. And in this game, there's a wrench you pick up in the beginning that heals you at the cost of this game's currency, gears. But if you don't pick it up, you can't heal outside of some very specific scenarios, which means the entire game becomes about getting hit as little as possible. So with that in mind, it's time to find out. Can we beat Haiku the robot without the wrench? All right, story time. Imagine, if you will, a world where humanity no longer exists. A world where the only remaining inhabitants are the robots they built, all hiding underground to avoid the nuclear fallout and acrid rains of the surface. Welcome, everyone, to Arcadia. Time to get started. Meet Haiku, our protagonist. He's a little guy, but with enough modifications, I'm sure he'll be up to the task of, well, whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. We've got our basic Metroidvania features on display today. Modular jumping, depending on how long you press jump, large sword arc attacks, and a dodge mechanic that lets us slide past enemies. And as we make our way into the abandoned wastes, the game does that wonderful thing where it teaches you the basics without giving you pop-up screens or tutorial menus. Jumping puzzles will be a thing, save stations are a reality and also heal you back to full health, and secrets are everywhere if you know what to look for and have the right abilities. And it's right here where the game tries to give you the healing wrench. But we don't need that. We play Dark Souls on the regular. How hard can this game be? Oh no. Oh no! Oh god, please, I don't want to die. Not even close, baby. At this point in the game, there's not much else to do but kill things and explore. So that's what we end up doing. And lo and behold, we find a friendly NPC hiding amongst the tires. His name is Limerick, and he's a detective. Allegedly. Apparently, the other machines that have been attacking us around the map are possessed. And Limerick doesn't exactly have high hopes for our survival. Say, you wouldn't have to be one of my audience members, would you? Limerick lets us know that we can smash certain devices around the world to unlock the map, then sends us off on our way. And so, after finding a rusty key and using it to unlock a door, we... Yeah, no, I'm not getting in that. We continue on in the wastes and find Pinion, the investor. Pinion tells us that we can stand next to this perch station to summon a little friend. Well, would you look at that? Hello there, little buddy. I'ma call you Harvey. Harvey here will actually keep all of our loose gears safe in a bank, so we won't lose them if we die. Nah, who are we kidding? When we die. Because we aren't using gears to heal ourselves, there's really no reason to keep any on hand. Which means that so long as I make a trek back to Harvey, my gears are safe and ready to be used whenever we find something to spend them on. Which brings us to the first boss, the Trash Magnet. The Trash Magnet only has two attacks. It slams into the ground, causing balls of trash to fall from the ceiling, and it has a rush attack, where it'll try to slam into you. Both attacks are easily avoided. And just like that, that's one boss down. And you all were worried about me going into the fight with half a- oh wait, there's a phase two. Phase two is similar to the first, but requires a bit more control of your character, which I don't have just yet. Oops. But hey, now we know dying causes you to lose half of the gears you're carrying. So that's something. And without much effort, we're back into phase two. I dodge the trash pillars, do my best to navigate the other projectiles in the arena, and after keeping up the pressure, we clear the first boss on the second try, and are rewarded with a boatload of gears, as well as our first upgrade, Electromagnetism. This upgrade lets me jump off any walls I collide with, effectively letting you wall climb, which is awesome, since most Metroidvanias keep these kind of navigation upgrades from you until about mid-game, and there's no better way to make a player feel more powerful than by giving them control over their environment. While jumping around, I heard something suspicious and saw a sound wave echo out across the map and found one of those devices that Limerick mentioned earlier. I smashed it until the noises stopped and finally got a solid peek at the map. Now this is a map I can get behind. Not only does it show the exact shape and size of the levels, but it also shows what's inside them and makes it clear where you haven't been yet. It still hides the rooms we haven't entered, but I always find that this kind of map makes me want to explore. Secret walls are fine and all, but rewarding players who are willing to scrutinize the map for smaller details is always a big plus in my book. All right, let's see, where are we going? Looks like good adventurers go right today. Wait, how big is this map? Oh, 
Uh, we might be here a while. Hey, Harvey, can you take these gears away from me? I can't be trusted. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I continue exploring the map and find Sonnet, a merchant of sorts. She doesn't have her full inventory yet, but she does have... Oh, God, you just put that thing right on top of the pile, didn't you? Guess I'll have to be careful when opening up stores from here on out. In any case, she has a rusty key that we can use to open up a door somewhere, but she also has a map sweeper, which will show any obstacles I haven't cleared yet on the map. After agonizing over it for a few minutes, I opted for the key, since that sounds a bit more important than map hints at the moment. And then I immediately found a treasure room that had the remaining 100 gears I needed for the map sweeper anyway. Go figure. But hey, best of both worlds. And now we can showcase the chip system. As we play through the game, we'll be finding all sorts of microchips. These chips all have special effects, like the map sweeper we found, and can be swapped out at any save station. They come in three flavors, and you have limited ports, at least for now, so you'll have to pick and choose your build as you play. But with that all done, it's time for the next boss, the Tire Girl. As the name implies, Tire Girl is made of tires, and also shoots tires, and is also tired of my shenanigans, apparently. She actually has three phases, with each phase making her spit out more tires at one time, which means you need to focus on the minions, or else you'll be overwhelmed pretty quick. However, as you can probably tell from the footage, killing the minions actually hurts the boss herself, which means that if you clear enough of them, you'll eventually kill the boss as well. Two bosses down. That wasn't so bad. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you meant the robots were actually possessed. But for our efforts, we gain a capsule fragment. Collect three of those and find a blacksmith who can fix them back together, and you'll get a new health container. More health means I can make more mistakes, so I'll take as many of those as I can get. Oh, hello there. A new friend. This guy's name is Rusty, an old adventurer. He's very much the Solaire of Arcadia, and even gives us some goodies when we find him. This time around, he makes it so that our map marks all the save stations that we find, which is great, considering those are the only way we can heal. I stumble upon some lore bits around the map, which seem to indicate that humans weren't exactly liked by the machines, then find some sort of goober that looks like it needs to be collected. Ah, crap, mulligan. Uh, let's try that again. Did that count? It looks like that counts. I have no idea what I just picked up. I also decided that this wall needed a good climbing, and was rewarded for my efforts with the Nomad's Plate. I don't like the way it looks, but I like what it does. If we equip it, it'll reduce how many gears I lose if I die which means I no longer feel an incessant urge to run back to Harvey every time I have more than 100 gears in my pockets. Thank God, my heart was starting to hurt. I also found the Infinity Edge chip, which makes it so that my sword attacks have a 10% chance to do double damage. No complaints from me. The less button mashing I have to do, the better. And after a few nerve-wracking jumping puzzles that remind me of Super Meat Boy, I navigate my way through the central core and all of its electric enemies until I find Quadern, the scientist. Turns out, Quadern here gives us gifts if we find any of those collectible neuron looking things. And boy howdy does he deliver on that promise. The man gives 100 gears per collectible, and also says he'll give me a chip that will change the run entirely. If we can find enough goobers anyway. So with that in mind, it's time to explore the... Uh, is that toast? Huh, it was toast. And also a sentient toaster named Splunk. Splunk seems a bit confused about her purpose, since, you know, machines don't eat toast. But hey, I'm sure she'll figure it out eventually. I make my way through some waterlogged tunnels, dodging enemies and drips of water as I go, and eventually find a blue chip, the coolant soluble, which removes heat from Haiku's system more efficiently. Oh uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Some abilities, like your dodge, create heat, as indicated by the bar on the top left. Use those abilities too many times, and you'll overheat, which means you can no longer use any abilities until the bar cools back down. So yeah, that chip we just got means we can dodge more often. Very useful. Oh look, another boss. The battery. The battery has several different modes of attack. It can latch to the ceiling and shoot electricity at you, plug into the ceiling and cause bolts of lightning to rain down from above, plug into the floor and force you up onto the walls to dodge its attack, or just jump around and try to smash you. But after a minute or two of constant swinging and a few lucky critical hits, the battery explodes, dropping a new chip. Electric orbs. These orbs circle around you as you zoom around, and will damage any enemies that bump into them. They disappear when they hit an enemy, but respawn pretty quickly. So if you're hurting for a little extra damage, these might be the way to go. It also can give you a little extra range for those hard to reach enemies. So yeah, good stuff all around. In any case, I fix up the clock in the area, which was missing a single gear, which summons the train. Not only does this act as a fast travel system for the entire map, but it's also used as a moving safe space for a number of friendly robots. Sonnet is on board and has a much larger stock this time around. Wait, is that a skull? Which I take immediate advantage of by buying a red chip socket and a sword extension to fill said slot. We bump into Rusty again, who does me the kindness of marking where all the train stations are on my map. And there's also Rondell, the welder, 
who will create new health nodes for us if we bring him enough pieces. I adjust my build so that my sword is longer and sharper, which will hopefully help keep both enemies and bosses at bay, and then head off to- oh, okay, there are ghost machines now. I have several questions. I find a small robot town hidden away in a corner, and get told by a robot mother that her children are stuck inside a steam room. Alright, well, good luck with that. Eh, considering I'm the reason that the steam room is even operational again, I should probably help get those kids out of there. Though now that I think about it, how, uh, how are their robot children? Did Mama Robot put them together? And if so, does she need to rebuild them every year to make them slightly bigger? And if so, then why did Mama Bot rewards me for my efforts by giving me the quick repair chip, which is super useful if you have the wrench. So yeah, did all that for nothing. Cool. But hey, at least we found the next boss. Mischievous. He certainly lives up to the name. He doesn't have a whole lot of attacks, but that doesn't mean he's a pushover. He can throw his wrench at you, does a spin to win attack, and occasionally gets tricksy and tries to warp on top of you. But after a few more swings and critical hits, Mischievous downs his last load and gives us a collectible. Wait, what did I just say? I buy the Agile Alloy Chip from Sonnet, which makes it so that I can swing my sword even faster, then make my way through the next area, the Factory Facility. The enemies here are a bit harder than what we've been dealing with thus far, but if you're quick enough, you can deflect most of their attacks. And if you look close enough, you can find my favorite NPC in the game. Mundo here actually has a bit of insight into why the robots are getting possessed. Turns out, it's a virus of some kind. Mundo is too big to get possessed, and according to him, we're too small. So that explains why we're still okay. Also, something else I noticed while talking to NPCs. Did you hear it? Their vocal callouts are actually the first lines of dialogue they say, garbled to sound like robots. That's actually a really cool touch. This game has a lot of little touches like that. Like the fact that my sword disrupts the lasers in this room a bit if I stick it into the beams. The dev didn't have to do that, but he did. Those awards were justified, I tell you what. But after some more Super Meat Boy platforming puzzles, it's time for the next boss. The Power Saw. He can shoot his saw blade at you, which is a bit hard to dodge if you're not paying attention, and also makes the blades around the room surge towards you. The blades also fall from the ceiling, so you have to keep your wits about you, but just like the tire boss, breaking the blades will hurt the power saw as well. Later phases have him jumping around the arena and dropping rains of blades down on you from above, but eventually, the power saw finally breaks down, granting us access to our next ability, the power ball. Uh, I mean the body modifier. Look, we both see the resemblance. Let's just admit that it's a cool power-up that belongs in every Metroidvania game and move on. With ball form unlocked, we can now squeeze through tiny spaces, but we can also move a lot faster than on foot, and can even shoot across large gaps that we wouldn't normally be able to jump over. I'll say it again, if you want a player to feel empowered, give them mobility options. I also found an extractor chip, which makes it so that enemies drop more gears on death. Not exactly something I need at the moment, since our gears are solely used for buying items and not for healing, but you never know might be useful later. I decided to make a quick shopping trip to the train and- Oh, uh, hi. You, uh, you're the train. Right, that makes sense. I decided to buy another health fragment from Sonnet, then have Rondell craft me a new health container. Ah, glorious. 25% more health, just like that. I get lost in a rolly ball maze, as you do, smash what appears to be an electrical beehive, because reasons, and get a small little bulblet bee, which follows me around and lights up dark areas. After that, I find Sprunk again, who seems once again to be looking for purpose. Apparently, she's building a house for small robots. I mean, I guess that's a house. It's missing a few important bits, like a roof or walls, but if you squint... Oh, I also found these two bozos hiding in a small room. Apparently, I can apply water and fire sealant to my body for 200 gears each. I wasn't entirely sure if it was an either-or situation or not, but money is no object, so I went ahead and got both treatments. And from what I can tell, both applications stay on. So that's another two upgrades applied, and I can now walk in water and deal with extreme heat. Back in the mainframe, I meet up with the ghost bot again. I guess his name is Verse, and he's the lore master of the game. Turns out, the virus is trying to get into the mainframe for some reason, and in order to get in there ahead of the virus, we need to seek out the three creators of Arcadia. Sounds simple enough. I murder, I mean purify, a bunch of my robot brethren, then spend my hard-earned gears on a blue chip socket and a protector capsule, which gives you an extra life node while equipped. And with that, it's time to put my heat sealant to the test, and enter the Firebomb Academy. The hard part about the incinerator is that you're constantly overheated, which means no dodging for you. It's kill or be killed in here. Combine that with some good old fashioned flame traps, and a few crazy cultists for good measure, and you've got yourself a good time. In all seriousness, it's not that bad. The controls are tight enough that navigating all the traps and jump puzzles is a fun time, and if you're able to make it through without hard boiling yourself, the Firebomb Academy rewards those who complete its teachings. Behold. The power bomb. Simply press a button 
and you explode, damaging everything around you. It does have a pretty high heat cost to do it, so you'll only get two blasts before you overheat, but depending on the situation, this upgrade could be very powerful. Remember that for later. For now, the bomb is mostly used for breaking structures and unlocking shortcuts in new areas. I find an electric key, accidentally discover that you can jump while in ball mode if you use a power bomb, then find our first creator machine, and he's happy to see ya. This boss can be a bit tricky. Not only does it have a slam attack that sends out shockwaves and projectiles from the ceiling, but it also has a laser that you have to dodge through, which can attack in several different formations. But with enough dodging and patience, anything is possible, and the first creator falls to my blade. Or rather, the virus inhabiting it does. The creator itself is actually still inside, and thanks us for our efforts once it's no longer possessed. Oh, and it's actually the third creator, not the first, I guess. Anywho, Electron strengthens my sword a bit, giving me a little extra damage, then heads off to find the others. The plot thickens. But with that done, it's time for Waterland. Thankfully, I'm immune to water, but not Robot Piranhas. I have another Solaire moment, where Rusty encourages me to keep going and gives me some map pins to mark NPCs on the map, then go on a side mission to explore a few areas that I missed my first pass through. The first one in the incinerator gives me the gyro accelerator, which increases my morph ball speed. Oh my god, say less. Woohoo! After that, I went back to Sonnet and bought some more health capsules, a green chip that makes it so that gears automatically fly to me instead of making me collect them, and a blue chip that leaves all the gears I drop on death in a collectible sphere that I can pick up later, much like a bloodstain in Dark Souls. After that, I went to a trash compactor of some kind, which was dark, loud, and filled with angry looking drills. Oh, and toast. Can't forget toast. How you got down here without a light, I'll never know. Inside the trash compactor, I fight another boss, the trash worm, which has two attacks. It either launches trash at you while hiding in the floor, or comes flying at you from all over the arena. Eater of Worlds style. Smash all five of the body segments, and it goes down without too much trouble, giving you a health capsule. Very nice. And after we escape that hellhole, we find Verse again, who gives me a bit of lore, tells me to keep searching for the other two creators, then gives me access to our next ability, teleportation. Because why dodge past enemies when you can teleport? It's also useful for warping through obstacles, which means a whole new set of areas are now open to us. Like this village of robots hiding amongst all the trash. Hey there, buddy. How's it going? Oh. Uh... Hey there. You seem chipper. I... Uh... Do you want to talk about something else? Uh... Plant world! Nothing but living things and good times in plant world! Isn't that right, Rusty? Oh, uh, thanks. Praise the gears and all that. I zoom my way through the forest, use a rusty key to open a door, and it's a mimic. Cool. I swear to God, if FromSoft ever makes another Soulsborne game, I will scream if there are door mimics. This boss is a strange one. It not only launches projectiles at you, but it also tries to force you into spikes on the far side of the arena by sending wave after wave of obstacles at you. Oh, and don't forget the occasional buzz saws. Because why not? Not a whole lot to this one. Easy boss. Moving on. On to the first tree. Wow. Either we're all extremely small, or this tree is extremely big. Ooh, chip socket. Ooh, and toast. Hey, Splunk, how's it going? And, uh, where are your legs? Oh, dang, six gears? Oh, gee, I don't know, I might need those. Nah, I'm just kidding. I love toast. Aside from finding broken toast, I also found several collectibles and a new red chip, magnetic footing, which keeps you from feeling any knockback when swinging your sword against enemies. Though, if I'm being honest, this one is pretty useless, considering I haven't noticed the knockback this entire time. Anyway, moving on. I explore a few spaces I haven't been to yet, Ew, spiders. And find some liquid coolant, which makes it so that all of my heat generating abilities cost less heat to use, which means more teleporting and more bombs. I also found another boss, the diving helmet crawlers. Nothing too fancy here, just a big old spider inside a diving helmet doing fancy flips and dips. And now there's two of them. Fantastic. Overall, this wasn't too bad. Just focus fire on one spider at a time if you can, and there you go. Hey, get back here and finish what I started. But after defeating the spiders, we get one of the most powerful upgrades that any metroidvania can ever give a player. The double jump. Now this is pod racing. I also found a new upgrade. A saw blade. Attach this sucker to your motherboard, and your morph ball becomes... well... a saw blade. Which more or less just means that if you bump into an enemy while rolling, the enemy takes damage while you hop away unharmed. There's a bit of a cooldown, so you're not invincible or anything like that. But that's a pretty neat trick if you're like me, and always forget to look before you leap. And why stop there? Pick up the auto modifier and you'll automatically transition into roly poly -oly mode whenever you hit the ground. Personally, I prefer the control of choosing when I am and am not a ball, but if you want one less button press, the option is there. I use my new double jump ability to climb up the first tree and find a little hideout at the very top. Oh hey, it's a creator. 
or the shell of one anyhow. I wonder what it, uh, uh-oh. Ow. Well, at least Mondo was correct. Looks like I'm too small to infect. I do a little backtracking to Quadrant's laboratory and get not only a health capsule for my troubles, but also a new red chip, the electro emitter, which says it periodically drops an electric spark that deals damage to enemies, which is true. But what it doesn't tell you is that periodically means every other second, which means that if an enemy is chasing you or hovering around you, you're getting free hits left and right. That's insanely broken, and I love it. I also found my new favorite toy in the entire game after zip zap zooping through some vents, the string and hook, which does exactly what you think it does. <laughs> this thing is dangerous. It's meant to be used to work around specific puzzles, but in the wrong hands, AKA mine, this thing becomes a way to skip entire rooms. There's no horizontal limit. So long as there's something solid to latch onto at the other end of the room, you're golden. But with all of these upgrades collected, we're pretty much done with the game. Time for one of the final areas, the last bunker. True to its name, this was the last bastion for the human race. It's also full of enemies that launch explosives at you, from rolling tanks to floating drones and their offspring. There's all sorts of human treasures here too, like this giant piano. Fun fact, I've actually been playing piano for like 20 plus years. I wonder. Hey, a goodie. It's only for an achievement, but still. Anyway, further on into awful horrible nightmare boom boom land, where the robots are almost as aggressive as the platforming usually leading to rooms covered in the last artwork of the humans who hid here. It's mostly hand turkeys. The silly little scamps, where are those humans anyway? Oh. Well, don't ask a question if you don't want the answer, I suppose. Jesus, the ground is literally made of skulls. How did things get this bad? Was that one of those collector bots from the Matrix out there? Nope, 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 nope. Turns out, there are actually some robots on the surface. I guess they go around collecting the bits and bobs left by the humans in hopes of selling them. Also, Limerick is here and gives us a lore tidbit that explains that Arcadia isn't the only robot nation that rose after the fall of humanity, and that he himself is from one such place. Well, we're already here, might as well see what they have. Oh good, another skull. Huh, they also have something that gives you extra iframes and defense, and also something that increases- Come on, Tony, you can come too. Not really sure what these are for just yet, but I've got them. Just in case, you never know. Man, humanity really did a number on the earth before they kicked the bucket, huh? Maybe the machines were right to be angry. Uh, machine overlords? For what it's worth, I'd just like to apologize for the human race. We're just really bad at being alive sometimes. Oh god, now I need to know. Will you remember I apologized when the robot uprising starts? Of course I'll remember, but it's always good to be on the safe side with apologies, just in case. What do you mean, just in case? There's no need to worry about that. I have a gun! I also found a heat drive which lets you use heat abilities in rooms that are too hot, like the incinerator. Definitely useful. Very glad I found that one. Huh. There's a giant hole in the bunker from one of the nuclear blasts. I guess we know why the humans didn't survive now. But on a much more positive note, I found Splunk again. Apparently, she's decided that just for now, her purpose is just to exist, and knows that someday she'll find her own way through life. And you know what? Considering everything that's going on out there right now, I think that's enough. Good on you, little toaster. You keep doing you. But enough philosophizing, it's time we got to work finishing the game, which means it's time to take on the next creator. This boss has a lot going on. It can slam into the earth and attempt to smash you into walls, nuke you from orbit with some sort of laser cannon, or a hellish combination of the two, which gets very hard to dodge if you aren't managing your heat properly. But with a healthy combination of extreme aggression and the occasional bomb blast, I get the creator into phase two, where, uh, you know, I think we should run, oh God, whoo, there we go. Easy game for babies. Definitely didn't die to this boss over 10 times. This one's name is Neutron, and it's the first creator. I'm not sure exactly what it's talking about, but it sounds like the three creators did something that they deemed necessary. And we all know how well that line of logic always works out. Anyway, sword damage upgraded, and a third red chip socket found, which I immediately jammed the electro emitter chip into. God, that's gonna do some damage to the bosses. In fact, why don't we test that theory out now? Time for the final creator fight. This fight is actually pretty difficult. I had to take up a chip slot for the heat drive so that I could actually dodge and use my bombs, and even then, it still becomes a battle of who could do the most damage first, since my dodging was less than spectacular. Though I did notice that using a bomb gives you iframes, so that's worth noting. Oh, but that was just phase one. We haven't even talked about phase two yet. Projectiles everywhere, pillars of flame shooting up from the floor, and a skill check to see if you've been managing your heat well enough to still have energy to dodge. Not gonna lie, this boss ruined me. I died here several times, which got really frustrating when a few of those times were right as the boss ran out of health. But eventually, after about 10 minutes of attempts, we've done it. Proton, the second creator, 
finally freed from their curse. We get a third sword upgrade, another coolant upgrade so that I can use even more dodges and bombs, and a final prodding from first to go to the mainframe vault to finish the fight. But before we go after the final boss, there's one more upgrade that I've been meaning to collect, auto repair. Normally a pretty lackluster improvement, this chip changes our build entirely. So long as we have gears in our pockets, whenever we take damage, we will automatically begin to heal, regaining a life after about 10 seconds or so. However, it's not as overpowered as it sounds. If we take damage while repairing, the skill will begin to heal the current most damaged node. Once that node is repaired, the auto repair stops, meaning that you will only ever repair one damage when the repair begins. If you keep getting hit, you're still going to lose life, no matter how many gears you have. I hunt down the last of the optional bosses I've missed along the way, like this television set, but if I'm being honest, there's not much challenge to it compared to the creators we've been duking it out with. More often than not, the bosses can't even seem to get a hit in, with my overpowered sword and bombs cutting their attacks short, and their lives even shorter. But there's something else hidden in the rubble, a secret passage, leading to a secret room full of skulls and graves, the catacombs. Ah, oh, this is the Kickstarter graveyard. I guess everyone who helped make this game a reality got a tombstone. And boy howdy are there a lot of tombstones. There are some really sweet messages strewn about here, with some truly beautiful sayings and thoughts. We've got time for one more. What's this one say? Oh boy. Poor Dylan here must be rolling in his grave. But the graves aren't just for show. Turns out those two Tonys we collected earlier in the run had a purpose, and reveal a secret passage. A secret passage which has the best upgrade a Firebomb Academy Scholar can ask for. The Power Processor, which reduces the heat cost of making bombs. And so my build is complete. Extra health, cheaper and stronger bombs, extra coolant to make my bombs even cheaper, and a little extra roll speed to make navigating the levels a breeze. And with my perfect build in hand, I collect the last few pieces of Quadrant's experiment, which reunites him with his wife, then do a few other side quests we've been quietly completing in the background, like finding Bo 9000 some food to prep, or bringing Melody the cassette player that tape we found earlier. They're just achievements, and we don't get anything practical, but it feels good to help out the last few robots, if only to enjoy the calm before the storm. But the storm cannot be stopped, and with the help of the three creators, the mainframe doorway is opened and we are able to enter inside where the fourth and final creator lies dormant, completely corrupted by the virus. This fight is a hard one, since the virus spills out from the creator in hard to predict ways, making dodging difficult. Thankfully, between the electric shocks, constant bomb blasts, and the ever-present sword swings, I'm able to burst down the boss and eventually free it from its metal prison. Oh wait, no, that's a bad thing, isn't it? Oh god, every bot for himself! But somehow, through the grace of whatever creator made my tiny metal body, we've done it. A final bomb blast and sword swing, and the virus that is the fourth creator is destroyed, leaving nothing in its wake but my sword and a faintly evil looking addition to its notches. And for a while, this was it. The end of the game, with evil sealed inside my sword. But then the game got a few free DLCs, and a new final boss reared their ugly head. With Versus Sacrifice, my corrupted sword can be purified into the true Master Sword, and the lost archives can finally be opened. Turns out, there's a bit more to the story than we thought. And while I won't spoil it for you now, let's just say we may have been duped. And so we begin our final fight. A battle against all three creators at the same time. I hope you've brought your best build to the table, because every single attack we've seen up to this point is on display here. And some of the combos are absolutely brutal when they're used in tandem. Some of the attacks have also been beefed up a bit, so it's not quite the same three fights you're used to either. Eventually, I destroy one creator, then another, and then finally, the last creator of the trio. And with that, my sword is cleansed, and the robots of Arcadia can rest easy knowing that the virus has been vanquished once and for all. And yet, there's still a bit more. There was actually another free DLC that was launched for Haiku, which only unlocks after you've beaten every single boss. Do that, and you'll unlock Old Arcadia, a relic of what the Machine City once was, complete with its own boss, which has all sorts of new attacks we haven't seen before. A good number of the attacks take up the entire screen, or require you to stand in very specific locations in order to dodge them. However, as with all the rest, this final boss is no match for my firebombs, and it's reduced to little more than a CPU. After that, there's some pretty wild platforming and the like that you can conquer, but the true focus of this DLC is the arenas it unlocked. If you're feeling like you haven't been challenged enough, you have two boss gauntlets to choose from. One simply lets you replay any boss you've beaten, giving you only the upgrades you would have had at the time. There's a few variations on some of the bosses, which tends to make them a bit more difficult, but otherwise there's not much to it. The other arena, however, is a different story. There are six different modifiers you can mess with. The rightmost three modify the type of challenge you'll be facing, while the leftmost switches change the type of boss gauntlet. You can fight off against every single normal boss, going from one to the next. You can fight off against each of the creators in turn. Or, for the truly sadistic, you can fight against both. 
As for the modifiers, you can play in underpowered mode, which takes away your abilities, haiku mode, which doesn't make any changes to your loadout at all, or wrenchless, which is what we've been doing this entire run. And that's not all. There's actually a new game plus, called Corrupt Mode, where you only have a single health point to start, almost all the NPCs are corrupted by the virus and can't help you on your quest, and I've been told there's even a super secret final boss at the end. But that's a challenge for another time, because for now, we've officially done it. We've beaten all of Haiku the Robot without using the wrench to heal, and we've even got the achievement to prove it. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this little backtrack down memory lane of mine, and who knows, if enough people demand it, maybe we'll even look into completing Corrupt Mode to see what changed. Oh, and one last thing before we go. The creator of the game actually made a second game called Rusty's Retirement, and it's a pretty unique idea. Basically, it's a minimal farm tending game that sits on your desktop while you do anything else you would normally be doing. For example, I've been playing the game the entire time I was editing this video. You can make it as big or as small as you need to, move it around your screen as necessary, and all sorts of other little options that make it non-obtrusive. It even has a way to show your support for the developer without ruining anyone's fun. If you like the game and want to show your support, the game is a DLC you can buy, and all it does is transform Rusty into his final Sunbro form. That's it. Thank you for your support, become gloriously incandescent. And I'll be honest, I think I like this game just as much as I like Haiku. I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to play Solaire Retirement Simulator? So yeah, if that sounds like something up your alley, maybe give that a look, and let the dev know that Lemon fulfilled his promise and finally made a video about his games. But other than that, that's all I've got. Take care of yourselves, be good to one another, and I'll see you all again soon.